Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we completed our understanding of the quantum numbers an atom can have, n, l, m, and s. Today, I want to start talking about some of the consequences of those quantum numbers. The first number is n, which has an integer value of 1 or higher. Next is l, which has an integer value from 0 to n minus 1. The third quantum number is m, which has an integer value from negative l to positive l. And the fourth and final quantum number is s, which always has a value of positive or negative 1 half. It turns out that we can use those four numbers to understand a lot about what atoms are like and how they bond and interact with each other. To do it, we just need three more pieces of information. First, most of the time, the lower the quantum numbers n and l are for an electron, the lower the electron's energy is. There are exceptions, but you'll learn about those later. Second, each orbital can only hold a maximum of two electrons, and these will have spins of plus and minus one half. If there's only one electron in an orbital, it can have either spin. This idea that an orbital can only hold a maximum of two electrons, and these have opposite spins, is called the Pauli exclusion principle, and it's named after the Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli. Pauli was one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics. He's also another example of a great scientist who became a refugee. He was forced to flee Europe when Austria was annexed by Nazi Germany. Although Pauli's parents were Roman Catholic, his father's parents were Jewish, and that heritage made it impossible for Pauli to remain in Nazi-occupied Austria. The third and most important fact that we need to know is that electrons always want to have the lowest possible energy. So, they'll always go to the lowest energy orbital unless that orbital is already full. Let's see what these three facts mean for the ways electrons behave in atoms. We'll start with the simplest atom, hydrogen. Using what we now know about electrons, we can determine all the quantum numbers for the electron in a hydrogen atom, and we'll also be able to tell what orbital it's in. So we'll start with n. We know that n can have any integer value from 1 on up. However, we also know that electrons like to have the lowest energy possible, so the electron will go into the lowest numbered shell, which has a value of n equals 1. Now we'll look at L. L can have a value from 0 up to n minus 1. In this case, that means L must be equal to 0. So that tells us that the electron is in a 1s orbital. Now we'll try m. m can range between negative and positive l. Since l equals 0, this means m must also be 0. And finally, let's look at the quantum number s. s can be negative or positive one half. There's really no reason why one is any more likely than the other, so s could be either one. As we'll see later in the video, knowing these four quantum numbers actually tells us a lot about how the atom will behave and what it looks like. It's such important information that chemists have developed two different ways of summarizing it. Both ways are useful in different situations, so we'll learn both. The first way is in what's called an orbital diagram. In an orbital diagram, we draw boxes for each type of orbital in our atom. In the case of hydrogen, we only have one orbital, the 1s orbital, so we only have to draw one box. We also label the orbitals, so we'll label this one with a 1s. Next, in each box, we draw each electron in the orbital using an arrow. We only have one electron, so we'll just draw one arrow in our box. We usually draw the arrows as pointing up or down. We often draw an up arrow for spin positive one half and a down arrow for spin negative one half. In this case, we don't know whether the spin is positive or negative, so we could draw the arrow pointing in either direction. I'll draw an up arrow. 
The orbital diagram may not seem like a very useful way of summarizing quantum numbers, but we'll look at orbital diagrams of some atoms larger than hydrogen in a moment, and then we'll see that diagrams like this can tell us interesting information about an element's magnetic properties. As I mentioned earlier, there's also a second way that we can summarize information about quantum numbers. It's called an electron configuration. To write one, we first write the name of each orbital type in the atom. In the case of hydrogen, there's only one orbital type, and it's a 1s orbital, so that's what we'll write. Next, after each orbital type, we write the number of electrons in the orbital as a superscript. In this case, our 1s orbital has one electron, so we put a superscript 1. And that's it for the electron configuration. Again, it may not be obvious yet why this is useful, but this is what's going to help us understand the way the periodic table is set up. Now let's try drawing an orbital diagram and an electron configuration for a larger atom. This time, we'll try an element you may rarely have used in class, beryllium. You may not know much about beryllium, but it's important in nuclear reactors and in superconductors, and it's also the element that gives the beautiful green color we see in emerald crystals. As you can see from the periodic table, beryllium has four electrons. Let's figure out their quantum numbers. As we saw with hydrogen, electrons want to have the lowest possible energy, so the first electron will go in the n equals 1 shell, and it'll be in an l equals 0 orbital, so it's in a 1s orbital. And as with hydrogen, the quantum number m for this electron must have a value of 0. For the moment, I'm going to skip the quantum number s, Instead, let's think about the second electron. Just like the first one, it wants to have the lowest possible energy, so it'll have n equals 1 and l equals 0, and so it will also be in a 1s orbital. And as with the first electron, we know that m must be 0. Now let's also think about the value of s, the spin quantum number. I said before that we don't know whether each electron has a spin of positive or negative 1 half. But remember what the Pauli exclusion principle tells us. It says that when an orbital contains two electrons, they must have opposite spins. So even though we don't know which electron has spin negative one half and which has spin positive one half, we know that both possibilities are covered by the two electrons. It doesn't really matter which is which, so let's say the first one is negative half and the second is positive half. For the third electron, we again want the electron to have the lowest energy possible, so it should have the lowest possible value of n. However, this time the electron can't have n equal to 1, because there is only one orbital with n equal 1, and that orbital's already full. There's not another orbital with n equals 1, because the orbitals for a particular shell must have l between 0 and n minus 1. The only possible orbital for n equals 1 is the one with l equals 0, and that's the one that we've already used. This means that the third electron must have n equals 2. For l, the electron must have a value between 0 and n minus 1. So since n is 2, l must be either 0 or 1. The electron wants to have the lowest possible energy, so l will be as low as possible, so it's 0. That means that this electron is in a 2s orbital. As with the earlier electrons, since l equals 0, m must also be 0. And electron 4 is in the same boat. It has n equals 2, l equals 0, and m equals 0. For the last two electrons, we don't know the value of s, but we do know that they're opposite in size. Just as we did for the first two electrons, we'll say the first one is negative half and the second one is positive half. So now we know the quantum numbers of each electron in a beryllium atom. Now we can draw the orbital diagram and the electron configuration. Remember, for the orbital diagram, we draw a box for each orbital and write the name of the orbital below each box. We have two orbitals, so we draw two boxes and the orbitals are labeled 1s and 2s. There are two electrons in each orbital, and we know they have opposite spins, 
so we'll put two arrows in each orbital, one up and one down. It would be wrong to draw two up arrows or two down ones, because that would mean both electrons in the orbital have an s value of negative half or positive a half, and that would violate the Pauli exclusion principle. Now let's write the electron configuration. This is super easy. We write the name of each orbital in order, with a superscript telling us how many electrons are in each. So the electron configuration of beryllium is 1s2, 2s2. So far, we've looked at atoms that only have electrons in s orbitals. The orbital diagrams look a bit different when we have other kinds of orbitals. For example, let's try the orbital diagram of an oxygen atom. The periodic table tells us that oxygen has eight electrons. From the work we just did with beryllium, we know that the first four will be in a 1s orbital and a 2s orbital, so we can start the orbital diagram with those. Just as in beryllium, each of these orbitals will have two electrons with opposite spins. But what comes next? It's still true that the electrons want to have the lowest energy possible, and they do that by having the lowest possible values of n and l. But it seems like there are two possibilities for us. We could keep n equals 2 and move to the next highest value of l, which will be l equals 1. Or we could bump n up to 3 and keep l at l equals 0. Which one of those is correct? It turns out that there's a simple and helpful little picture we can draw to help us out. To make the picture, we write the possible values of n vertically, like this. n can go from 1 to infinity, so we'll just have to stop sometime. I'm going to stop with n equals 5. But remember that this pattern continues past the bottom of what I'm drawing here. So that's what we write in the vertical direction. In the horizontal direction, we'll write the different orbitals that we could have for each value of n. So, for example, if n equals 1, l can only equal 0, so the only orbital is a 1s orbital. For n equals 2, l can be 0 or 1, so we could have a 2s or a 2p orbital. We continue this pattern for every value of n, and what we end up with is a nice triangle listing the different orbital types that an atom can have. To finish this diagram, we draw a series of diagonal arrows that point down and to the left. We end up with a pattern like this. This series of arrows tells us the order in which we should put electrons into orbitals as they fill up. So we start with the 1s orbital. When it's full, we move on to the 2s orbital. And that's what we did when we were studying beryllium. As this diagram shows, the next orbital we fill should be the 2p orbital. So in our example of oxygen, the 2p orbital is the next one we should draw. But wait, unlike the s orbitals, there's more than one p orbital. Remember, because l equals 1 for a p orbital, m could have a value of negative 1, 0, or positive 1. Those are three different orbitals, so there are three 2p orbitals. We show that by drawing three connected boxes in our orbital diagram. So now we need to put arrows in those boxes. Remember, oxygen has a total of eight electrons, and we already drew four of them, so there are four more electrons to go. Which of the boxes should they go in? That problem was solved by the German physicist Friedrich Hund, Another great physicist who was a young man living in Europe during World War II, like Niels Bohr and Wolfgang Pauli. Hun lived to be 101 years old, so maybe being a scientist is good for your health. Hun showed that when you have more than one orbital of the same type, like these three 2p orbitals, one electron with the same spin goes into each orbital before the electrons pair up. So, in our example, we have four electrons. One electron will go into each orbital, and the fourth one will pair up with one of those. It doesn't matter which box we put the paired electron in, but I'll put it in the first box. This idea that when we have several orbitals of the same type, one electron goes in each before the electrons begin to pair up, is called Hund's rule. Notice that, unlike the case for beryllium, we can see that oxygen has some electrons that aren't paired up. 
This turns out to be very important for the magnetic properties of atoms. It turns out that a spinning electron generates a magnetic field. When two electrons with opposite spins pair up, the magnetic fields tend to cancel out. But if we have several unpaired electrons, that makes the element magnetic. For example, iron, which is very magnetic, has several unpaired electrons. Based on its orbital diagram, we can now draw the electron configuration for oxygen. It's 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Notice that the electrons in all three 2p orbitals are lumped together in the superscript. This will be true every time we have several of the same type of orbital. Now let's try drawing the orbital diagram and electron configuration for a larger atom, molybdenum. When we do, we'll notice that there's a pattern that'll tell us the secret of the periodic table's shape. Molybdenum has 42 electrons, so we're going to have several orbitals to draw. We'll use the triangular diagram we drew earlier to help us. It shows that we start with a 1s orbital, then 2s, and then 2p. Next will be 3s, then 3p, and then 4s. After that will be the three d orbitals. Remember, a d orbital has l equals 2, so m can have a total of five different values, negative 2, negative 1, 0, positive 1, and positive 2. So there are five different 3d orbitals, which means we'll have five connected boxes in our orbital diagram. After the 3d orbitals come the 4p, and then the 5s. If you count up the number of electrons we've drawn so far, you'll see that we have 38 of them. Remember, molybdenum has 42 electrons, so we still have four more to go. The triangle diagram tells us that the next set of orbitals should be 4d. As with the 3d orbitals, there are five possible values of m, so there are five different 4d orbitals. But we have only four electrons left. Remember, Hund's rule tells us that each orbital of the same type gets one electron before they start to pair up, so we'll put each of our four electrons into a different box. So that's our orbital diagram. If we now write the electron configuration, we'll get 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d4. And this can finally help us unlock the secret of the periodic table's shape. Let's look at the orbital diagram and the electron configuration a little more closely. Notice that the full orbitals we've looked at so far contain either two electrons for the s orbitals, six electrons for the p, and 10 electrons for the d orbitals. We haven't worked with f orbitals yet, but when we do, you'll see that a set of f orbitals can hold up to 14 electrons. So again, the orbital types can hold 2, 6, 10, or 14 electrons. Now look at the periodic table. Notice that this area of the periodic table is two columns wide. This area is six wide. The middle is 10 columns wide. And these rows down here are 14 wide. This corresponds exactly to the number of electrons in different types of orbital. This is not a coincidence. It turns out that the periodic table follows the pattern in which orbitals get filled by electrons. For example, let's look at molybdenum again. The electron configuration gives us the order of the orbitals. There are two 1s electrons, two 2s, 6, 2p, 2, 3s, 6, 3p, 2, 4s, 10, 3d, 6, 4p, and 2, 5d electrons. Finally, there are 4, 4d electrons. If we count 4 elements into the 4d group in the periodic table, we find out that this element in that position is molybdenum. This pattern makes it possible for us to figure out the electron configuration of any element without having to draw out the orbital diagram. For example, take plutonium. 
Plutonium has a huge 94 electrons. It would take us a lot of space to write out its orbital diagram, but now that we know about the secret of the periodic table, it'll be easy to write its electron configuration. The electron configuration will be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6, 6s2. But now we have to be a little careful. As the triangle diagram showed us before, the next orbitals are 4f orbitals. We can see on the periodic table that the last element we covered was barium, number 56. The next one will be number 57, which is down here, lanthanum. It's the first element in this row, which is 14 columns long. The reason why we draw these elements down here instead of next to barium is because if we did, the periodic table would be too long to fit on a piece of paper. It is possible to find periodic tables that are drawn that way, and you can see that it's kind of inconveniently long. Anyway, these elements have electrons in the 4f orbital, so the next part of the electron configuration is 4f14. The set of orbitals after that is back up here next to barium, so it's 5d10. Next is 6p6, then 7s2. Finally, we have to go back to the bottom of the periodic table again. These are 5f orbitals. Plutonium is the sixth one in this row, so the electron configuration ends with 5f6. The person who created the modern periodic table was Dmitry Mendeleev. His periodic table definitely looked different than ours, because lots of elements we know about today hadn't been discovered yet but he came up with the general idea. He didn't know about quantum numbers or electron configurations either, but it turns out that, as you saw, the table he created has the same pattern as electron configurations do. Mendeleev overcame a lot to become the great scientist that he was. He was the youngest of 17 children, 14 of whom died young. His father died when he was young, leaving the family with no income, so his mother reopened her family's old abandoned glass factory in order to make ends meet, at a time when entrepreneurial women were very rare. Unfortunately, that factory burned down when Mendeleev was still just 13. But by that time, Mendeleev was starting to show promise as a student. So when it was time for him to attend college, his mother sold everything that they had and took him by train all the way from Siberia where they lived, to St. Petersburg to enroll him in a school there. After he graduated, Mendeleev came down with tuberculosis and nearly died. But once he regained his health, he started working on the science that later made him famous. One last thing. You've probably noticed that the electron configurations of molybdenum and plutonium are pretty long. For long configurations like these, we can use a shortcut. If you look at the periodic table again, you'll notice that all the inert gases except helium have electron configurations that end with P6. We can use this to save ourselves a little work when we write an electron configuration. Here's how. Suppose you want to write the electron configuration for molybdenum. We look at the periodic table to find out which noble gas is the last one before the element we're interested in. In this case, the last inert gas before molybdenum is krypton. Its electron configuration ends with 4p6. So instead of writing molybdenum's whole electronic configuration, we'll replace the entire beginning part of the configuration up to 4p6 with the symbol of the inert gas in square brackets, and continue the electron configuration after that. In the case of molybdenum, that gives us kr in brackets, followed by 5s2, 4d4. This is called a condensed electron configuration, and it's a lot shorter than the full electron configuration we wrote before. All the electrons we replace with the inert gas symbol are called core electrons, and the ones after that are called valence electrons. 
As we'll see later in this course, it's the valence electrons that do most of the interesting stuff in chemical reactions. The condensed electron configuration for plutonium is an even bigger time saver. The last inert gas before plutonium is radon, whose electron configuration ends with 6p6. So the electron configuration for plutonium has radon, Rn, in brackets, followed by 7s2, 5s6. So the interesting chemistry that plutonium can do involves those last eight valence electrons. The other 86 electrons are the core electrons. One last thing I want to mention. Sometimes the electrons don't obey the order that's given in this triangular diagram, but you won't need to worry about those exceptions. You'll learn about them if you take an inorganic chemistry course. But for us, this diagram will work for all the examples you'll see in homework, tests, and on quizzes. Well, that's enough new material for one video. Next time, we'll find out that the periodic table can tell us lots more about the properties of atoms and ions, and that's the stuff that makes the periodic table such a useful tool for chemists. So until next time, have a good week!